Welcome to Culture Before Content. Culture Before Content, from music for all and presented by Yamaha. And now, here's your host, David Duarte. Hey, welcome to the show. My name is David Duarte, and I'm the host here at Culture Before Content. And I just want to thank everyone for coming today. I'm sure nobody's watching football here at this moment, but... Uh, for those of you watching or listening later on, um, just know that we're doing all this during the Super Bowl. Um, so I'm, don't tell me the score because I'm dying to find out where we're at in all of this. So uh, welcome to my audience. I hope you find today's show to be uh, super fun. I think you're going to really enjoy our guest today. Um, I just want to, to remember that this is a Music for All podcast and we're sponsored by Yamaha. Uh, Music for All's mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through music. And that's for everyone, including me. So not only the students, but you teachers too, which is why we're here. So I hope this podcast and the great content on the Music for All podcast network helps support their, their mission and their vision. So welcome to Culture Before Content, the podcast that aims to transform the band classroom into a dynamic space of collaboration, growth, and musical exploration. Our mission is to share real life stories and practical excuse me and practical advice from educators nationwide and even more than that business people administrators you wait it's coming um, and it's to share real life stories and practical advice from everyone highlighting how fostering an inclusive and positive culture boasts and boosts student engagement and significantly enriches the educational journey um, and just as a reminder um, this is episode three and we're live. Oddly, it feels the same to me because I still am the only person in this room. Uh, but if you haven't, I encourage you to explore the prior podcast featuring insights from my guest, Matt Wood, um, who taught us that success looks different from different people. Um, he teaches us that that, um, that nuanced paths from his students can lead and lead his students to achievement um, and helping them set their musical and personal goals, emphasize the importance of individualized approaches. Scott Lang, uh, a dynamo on our last podcast, uh, his belief is that culture comes from the person at the podium. That's us. Come to find out that's us. And he shared a bunch of strategies and he really took it to task on me on interviewing. Um, and he becomes a catalyst for a thriving classroom environment. It's great. Um, but today we're all about making the band class the place to be for all of our students, a spot where everyone learns, plays and grows together. Um, it's all about bringing that sense of community and culture into the mix and shake things up. We all know about the notes and the rhythms, but this is everything that goes before that. Making that connection so that when you teach those notes and rhythms, it's in, it's ready to go. Um, and hey, for those tuning in online or catching up later on YouTube, jump into the comment section and share your musical tales. It's all about creating a space where everyone's journey adds to our culture, making learning and music more personal and fun. So just a few reminders and what I and what I believe and why we're here is we are the salespeople of our content. It is what we do and how we do it. You don't have to have my personality. As a matter of fact, I don't recommend it for anyone. Um, you got to have your personality and sell that personality to your children and use it to your advantage. Um, the social emotional influences that we make every day in the classroom are huge. Making our kids feel welcome, making our feel, kids feel important, whether it's competitive, happy. I know I saw a post today on Facebook of somebody sharing how quickly they did a piece of music because they only had like 20 seconds and it was great. It was about how fun it was for the kids and what an impact it made on the game. And lastly, we all have a shared vision. We are the guides. We are not, I don't think, you know, I say we're music educators, but I feel like we're more of the guide. Um, and what we do help students find their vision and help them share what our vision. So help shape it. Invite your friends to the podcast, participate in the discussion if you're watching live, or if you're not watching live, go back and make a comment later. Engage with us and help us shape what this becomes. As we know, programs come in all shapes and sizes, and we hope to address every one of those over time. We want to recognize what happens in all types of schools and programs, and hopefully we feel a little bit less alone. So help me shape this place into a place that's for everyone. And now, finally, on to the best part where I stop talking and we can start listening. Um, today's uh, topic is cultivating connections, the melody of rehearsals and relationships. You're about to meet someone very passionate about the music classroom and someone I think you're just going to adore. Um, this is Vanessa Cobb, and she comes to us today from Montgomery Central High School. Um, it's in Cunningham, Tennessee. If you don't know where that is, it's uh, near Clarksville, um, right up there on the northern side near the Kentucky-Tennessee border. So please welcome Miss Vanessa Cobb. Hello, hey, hello. You, hey, hey, you made it. It's like magic. I just say things and people magic. pop up. 
Um, so <laughs> tell us a little bit about, before we get going in the interview, why don't you tell us a little about, um, you know, we already got your name, we know where you're from, but tell us a little about you, your school, um, and maybe a little hint on the relationships and why you're here. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I do live in Clarksville. I um, grew up in a town called White House, Tennessee. It's about 30 minutes north of Nashville. Had a fantastic band experience of my own. Had a wonderful band director who was the reason why I do what I do today. Uh, his name was Brad Kinney. Um, just taught me about music, but more so about life in general and how to be a good person and uh, do that through making music. So um, he really inspired me to to become a band director he passed away unfortunately between my freshman and sophomore year we had brass week and in, in june and and then he passed away before a band camp in july um and he called me the night he passed away from the hospital to tell me he was sorry i was 15 trying to get my first job at mcdonald's and at the time at white house that was like the only thing right to work at oh so God. i was trying to get a job i know and he called to say he was sorry he got sick and he couldn't write the thing and i said it was totally fine. I was going to come see him the next day and I uh, was going to come with the drum major. She and I were good friends and um, got the phone call the next morning that he passed away. But he was just an in inspiration to me and um, just want to be that for my students um, today. So um, so I came to Austin P. Let's go P in Clarksville, Tennessee. I'm, I'm not sure Had a great experience there. <laughs> um, it's like number one cheer in the nation at one point, I think. <laughs> uh, but I came to Austin P. So thankful I came to Austin P. I think uh, I like to tell people it's the best kept secret in, in Tennessee. Um, there's a lot of good things happening there at the, at the music building and um, a lot of great music professors and that shaped my life as well. And then I started teaching in Clarksville, um, actually in, in Robertson County, one county over at White House Heritage. And spent about a year and a half there with J.R. Baker, who's a good friend of mine now. Um, and then an opening came up in Clarksville, which was closer to my house. So came there and um, just, just had a series of moves until I, I think I you know, have finally found my home at Montgomery Central. Um, a unique uh, start at, at Montgomery Central. Um, they had band camp in July of 21. And two days before band camp was supposed to start, the band director uh, moved on to a different different job. So they were scrambling to find somebody. Um, my good friend, John Schnettler at Austin P, who's the associate director of bands, um, it just happened. He lives really close to there. He's like 80 seconds from the house, from the high school. Uh, and he has two girls that are coming through the band program. One's just started a sixth grade band and he knocked on the door after he found out and the, the head admin was there and was like, let me help. How can I help? Let me do band camp. So he actually ran band camp and they did some pet band tunes and, um, not much of a show, but just did band camp and kept it going. Um, and I tell him today that he saved the program because I think without that, it would just have gone way downhill. Um, and then they hired somebody and that person taught a month and a half and just quit teaching altogether. And then John called me. I had actually just moved um, the year prior to a different job, uh, one county over. And he called me. He's like, you know, I know you just made this move, but this admin, let me tell you, this admin is just fantastic. I've never never known an admin who's like willing and ready to go uh to help the band program grow um and so i got in a zoom i had a zoom interview in the parking lot of my school that i was at and when i got in there i just felt like i was talking to myself and uh just really felt very comfortable with the admin so i said yes to that and then i came in um after fall break so october 18th um, was my wow. first first day in the class with those students and they were, you know, they had been through a lot. And prior to COVID, I, you know, I think that maybe the program was not not doing what it needed to be doing. And um, so it was pretty low point when I came in and morale was very low. And um, so I just have spent the past three years building relationships with people to make the program where it is today. And it's, I'm, I'm happy to say, I feel like it's flourishing. Um, you know, we're pretty rural school. We have a thousand and seven students in the high school um so it's you know it's a smaller school even though it's part of this larger district in, in clarksville uh, we're kind of across the river we are actually across the river um so we're kind of out there by ourselves but um it's just good people good good uh, students good parents and a fantastic admin so just been building in that way well that's awesome well i gotta ask you one question that you didn't answer mm -hmm. because it's one that okay. always i uh, 
What's your primary instrument? I'm a French horn player. Woohoo! I, I love finding what everyone plays. We all come at mm -hmm. this from different, and uh, it's really neat to find out, you know, yeah. um, what what people play. So this this seems to like lead to my. Except these questions mm -hmm. for me always come from where I'm hearing you. Um, so I yeah. know you are all about relationships, and I did not know that you took over like October 18th. How many was that? Like two months into this, or two months? Yeah, was that about two yeah. months into the semester? Wow, I can't yeah. imagine. So like, and then prior. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, prior to me getting there, they just, you know, John Schnettler kept helping out and they put like uh, soon to be student teachers in there throughout the day until I could get there. And um, he ran a few football games and then I came in and we finished up the season. We even performed at a contest. We, although we didn't compete, um, we were in an exhibition at the Mid South Marching Invitational. But I thought it was important just to get the kids in uniform, get the seniors, you know, a year that they could be proud of. So we just, you know, kept going. How were the kids when you first started? Because I've I've taken over with mm -hmm. like one day's notice before, yeah. um, and I yeah. know that the kid, you know, first off, I don't even think I have time to 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 respond to the kids, but I have to get to know them really well. What were they? What were the kids like for you? What was the culture of the school yeah. like before you started? Um, so the kids were, I I think, rightly so apprehensive. I mean, they had two people quit on them basically in a span of three months. So, um, and I don't think um, that. Maybe it was the best situation before with um, before I got there with the one that was there for a while. And um, so they I like to tell people, I feel like sometimes they were like little little puppies that were just needing attention, you know. Um, but at the same time, the other flip of the coin, they were ready and willing to be taught. Um, they just want to play their instruments and they wanted to play music and they wanted to have a good time doing that. Um, and so I, I did that. I the school. <laughs> The band was not part of the school culture when I got there at all. Wow. They were doing zero activities other than the football games. Um, so when I first met with parents, um, that was one of my first questions is what, what do you want to see changed? And they, the, uh, some of them were former band parents uh, or band students themselves. Um, and so they said, we want to, you know, when we were in band a long time ago, we, we played at everything. So that was one of the first things I worked on, on, on fixing was we started playing at all kinds. We played, we have played at wrestling matches. We have played at volleyball games. We played, um, at a softball game. Um, we, we have done all basketball, football, um, you name it, we've done it, um, and, you know, now, we, of course, we get asked every year, are you coming? Are you going to come play senior night and all that stuff? And they look forward to it, you know, uh, but it wasn't part. And we didn't even have an original or any kind of, we're the Indians. So we had the Tomahawk Chop as our, what they call the fight song. So I changed that last year and we have an original uh, fight song with words that the student body, I was able to teach the student body um, at a pep rally and freshman orientation, um, as, as well as the alma mater. Um, and they didn't even like sing it or play it together. But now at the end of every game or activity, school function, you know, we play the alma mater and the student body sings with us. And I, the choir teacher and I both taught that at pep rally and freshman orientation. So they know the tempo, they know the pitches. Um, and so, you know, it was really cool. And um, Friday night we had a basketball game and we won like in the last seconds and they were so hype and uh, it was just cool. I bring the band down around and we stand in front of the student body and um, it's just really an electric feeling, you know, to have them. And so now when we go, they get mad if we don't go to away game, you know, where's the band? Why weren't you there? Why aren't you coming? You know, um, so it's good. It feels good to be wanted. And I, I know by the look of my students' eyes that they're proud, you know, of their program. Um, and that was just with changing a school culture. Doesn't not, not even like anything we do extra, you know. Yeah, but some I, I always say this. You you do a ton of things as a band director that maybe mm -hmm. you don't notice or that now you notice. Right. Looking back to your first performances and say to this, mm -hmm. you know, season's first performances, how have things changed? Mm -hmm. What have you set up? What are some things yeah. that you've done to create that culture? Yeah. Um, well, one was just, you know, getting everybody on board. There was no culture of attending rehearsals. Like, it's just cool to skip rehearsal today, you know. So um, just, um, you know, making what sure the kids know the importance of being there and being focused and all in on rehearsals. But how did you get them to show up? I've heard this one a lot. Like, yeah. I'm all I'm all over Facebook and the pages mm -hmm. and listen, and I do. I pay attention to what people have to say, you know, mm -hmm. and it might be for, you know, things come naturally to some yeah. people. Yeah. Was it 
I mean, how did you compl- create the demand for showing up versus the supply yeah. supply rehearsal? What changed? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think just one being a positive. Like I try really hard to be positive when I'm on the podium and be exciting um, and just drawing in that energy. But I started something and I used to do this in middle school band when I taught middle school band, but I have um, parent meetings at the beginning of the school year when I was teaching sixth grade band and then um, coming in Well, I did the first year I got there, I did it with all parents, but um, I set up expectations in a parent meeting and I call it how to be a band parent, you know, um, cause not everybody that signs their kid up for band was a band kid. And so they don't the, really know like what the what expectations are. are. You could, what are some of those specific, uh, what are those specific things that you expect from the parents? What are those? I mean, what are some specific things that you've added? Yeah. I just, you know, my talk with them is we can't grow unless we're here, unless we're engaged um, and excited and on fire for what we're doing. Um, so just asking them to partner with me, you know, and making sure that we are there and that we're we're working on a product that we can be proud of. Um, and just that little conversation of just, will you work with me? Will you be here? Will you help in the parent organization? Um, Cause you're going to get to be part of a family. And then I just talk about being the six through 12 band family. Um, and, and that, you know, we want to, to learn how to do this. Well, I really want my kids to learn how to do it for life. Cause like what sport can you play? You might could play golf until you're 70, 80, but you're not going to play football or basketball until you're 80, but you can play your instrument. God willing that your mind is good and all that you can play in a nursing home and give a little Sunday afternoon concert for your friends. Like that's what I wish for my kids. Um, and so I just part that we have some, um, you know, some values for our um, band. Um, and I talked to the parents about those um, and how that's going to be, you know, helping us build the program so they can get an investment back um, from, you know, what they've put in so far. Um, Cause I want my kids to go to college and I want them to, you know, get college scholarships. And, um, you know, I think having a program that's worthy is something that will help them do that. And so I think at the end of that meeting, the parents are, you know, fully aware of like what band can do for their kids. And then they're a partner with me. And then, you know, here we are more people at rehearsals and then on the kids side, just being making it exciting. You know, I try really hard every rehearsal, although I, I'm not perfect at it. I try really hard to make sure they have a musical experience that, that gets their hair raised, you know, um, and gets them connected with the music. Um, and then just having a good time, you know, we joke around and have fun and it's not all serious, although, you know, it is at times when we're getting in the weeds and the pitches and rhythms and things around the notes and stuff. But, you know, I try, I try very hard for them to walk away wanting more. Well, you definitely sound like an organized person. And, and I know that organization is your thing. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, I I haven't met you, but I've met you long mm-hmm. enough to know how that you're a very organized person. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I think when we talked before, this is one of the things that interests me to share with others. Mm-hmm. You want your students to be organized. And can you mm-hmm. expand on that and give me the explanation yeah, yeah. of what that means? Yeah, I just, um, everything has a place in our band room. <laughs> Like it is not a messy room. It's very straight. My house is that way. That's how I, I can't function in chaos. uh, If that makes sense. Um, So I am a better teacher when things are in place. Um, So I just have policies and procedures for the students. Like they know exactly what to do when they come in the room. They expect the same thing every day. It's never what I do in the band room doesn't change as far as how, what order of things we do. Um, they have, you know, we have Google classroom set up. Um, so they know how to do that and turn in things that way. Um, if it's a hard paper, you know, I have a place for that. Um, I have weekly updates that they check and they know exactly what's going to happen for this week and parents get that too. Um, so communication is a big factor, um, at, at Montgomery central for us, just making sure, cause we do do a lot of events, um, and a lot of rehearsals and things like that. So, um, you know, everything has its place and the kids, you know, now I had to teach it over a period of the first year, but you know, I like the chairs and stands to be straight when we leave. And I don't even have to tell kids now, you know, they just, 
go put it back because they know Miss Cobb likes it. So, you know, so we got to be a certain way. That chair has to be on the square you know, <laughs> of the tile, you know. <laughs> um, so it's they have pride in it. I did some things to the band room when I got there. It was pretty a pretty blah band room, like nothing exciting going on. So um, if you look at my band room, right behind me is this huge wall. Our, our band room used to be the theater, old theater. So I have this half moon kind of thing. <laughs> Um, and so there's this big wall that used to be the back of the theater stage and it was just white, <laughs> like a really ugly white. Um, so I painted it school colors and it's really vibrant. And then the back of the band room behind, uh, behind the kids is the school blue. We are, we're red, white, and blue. And so the band room is just full of red, white, and blue and it's exciting. And we have the big, um, logos. I made a logo specific to us and it's on the walls. Um, so there's just some pride in that sense in the band room, you know, um, but everything's in its place and percussion, clean everything up and put it up. Like, I don't have to do that anymore. And, um, although they are percussionists and sometimes yeah, so there are things is, <laughs> I, I, I may or may not be speaking yeah. for myself. Okay. So what if your band room is too small and say yeah. you have those same expectations on your kids mm -hmm. and they're knocking mm -hmm. out of the park and you don't have enough room. What mm -hmm. kind of I got any suggestions for that? Like when Yeah, you, when I mean I'm I'm kind of there I'm there right now cuz we don't I don't have a traditional band room so I don't have a uniform room I don't have practice rooms. Um we do have lockers for instruments um so that's you know a good thing. They're out in the open so I can keep an eye on everything which I kind of like they're just on the back walls. Um but I am in the need for a uniform room so um based on relationships and the building that I've created. I've, I've been trying really hard this year. The There's a room just right across from us, about five feet, and I'm currently bargaining with my admin, hoping uh, to get that room because it would be the perfect uniform, music library, um, things like that. But I am lucky that there is this one room right there. Um, there are other rooms in the building we have discussed on having that. Um, so we have the ability, we just got new uniforms like two years ago. So just trying to find a place to lock them up and secure them. Cause right now they're just out in the open. Um, so, you know, just trying to find uh, what space I'm working with the choir teacher, you know, my library is in her library right now. And she's really great at sharing that. And, um, you know, I, I joke with people that my, my retirement job is going to be to be, I don't know if you've seen home edit on Netflix. Have you seen home edit? Mm -hmm. These ladies from Nashville, actually, they're based out of Nashville, I think, but they go around and uh, organize people's, uh, you know, whatever they need, garage or uh, office space. But oh, I jokingly I say I'm going to travel around and be home edit for band directors because I've yeah, taken over a couple spots, you know, and it's like crazy. Like when you just need to like cull stuff out, you know, and, like, I don't think that better. would be retirement. That's not right. <laughs> I could do that now. You're gonna, to, you're gonna have to get a whole crew and like have like you know because if you yeah. come to the Pacific Northwest, I got plenty mm -hmm. for you to do. You can start here and start. Yeah, go I on. love doing that stuff. It's like a I don't know side thing for me, but I love to organize things. And I think a lot of people don't realize that their space could function better for them if they just did a couple things to it. You know. So do your students overtake some of this organizational chaos? Do they, do they, mm -hmm. do they know what to do? Do they do it without being told? Do they, I mean, yeah. I guess it's kind of, I'm just kind of morph this into like kind of mm -hmm. your student leadership yeah. thing. Cause mm -hmm. it just sounds like, you know, you know, first yeah. off you, you came in, you, you changed what was there, got them excited, mm -hmm. got them showing up. I think that is the most important thing mm -hmm. is just to figure out the culture. Then you organize the mm -hmm. room. I believe a clean space. And I'm personally, I think yeah. a clean space and a safe space is, is everything. And trying to get that in some of our band rooms, mm -hmm. you do the best you can. Um, but yeah. then it leads into the student leadership. So what do your students do? Yeah. What, do you have an official leadership capacity? Um, so I'm, those kinds of yeah. things? I might be on the other side of the fence on this, but I don't have official leadership other than my seniors. So I feel like being a senior, you've stuck it out for four years, right? And you, especially the past two senior classes, because they have been through a lot of changes. Um, you know, I just talk with them. I meet with them. Um, and I, you know, they are the examples and leaders. Um, and I just tell them, this is your program and we can work together. Um, it's always we <laughs> in my band room. What can we do? How can we fix this? What do we need to do for the next rehearsal? Um, you know, that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, I think they have, they were lacking so much pride in the program that now they have that they're like, they don't want to lose that, you know, 
Um, and so they just, um, they just do that. I do have a couple, I have one aid um, that guidance gives me. So that person helps me with the library kind of things. Um, um, and then, um, you know, the senior class just kind of takes care of stuff, but I don't know. It's more like they, I do a lot of work at band camp too. We do a lot of team building exercises um, during our downtime uh, of our long week. And so I think that setting them up at the beginning of the year like that, uh, most of my kids do marching band. It's not required for me uh, that they have to do marching band, but um, they most of them do because they love it and it's fun. And, um, you know, so I, I do a lot of upfront work in the summer um, trying to teach them how to be um, leaders in their in their in their band program. Um, and then we just work together the rest of the year and it just kind of falls into place. You have to have some secrets though, because I always, you know, I say this, you know, when you make marching band optional, mm -hmm. um, I think yeah. I was, gosh, I was a long time yeah. ago for me when I did that. It, a, mm -hmm. it changed mm -hmm. the culture of my program in a way I never mm -hmm. thought possible. It made the kids that want to be there there. And then it did, it created a demand. What are some of mm -hmm. the things that made it so that most of your kids want to do it? It can't just be as simple as yeah, hey, yeah. it's optional kids. Cause I yeah. always think we all fear every kid's going to quit. Yeah. Well, I think um, the shows we pick are really important. You know, I'm um, not on the fence of like highly competitive shows. So we do a lot of fun um I guess you could call Friday night crowd fun, you know? Um, so, you know, we just do last year, we did a dance show. I can't say what we're doing this year. Cause I haven't told the kids, but that's in two days. <laughs> so then I can tell you what it is. Um, and I'm afraid they might be watching. So I can't, can't release well, that put, information. Well, you can put it on the, <laughs> on the, on the, on the YouTube comments in a couple of days. I want to know. Yeah, I can. Is. Yeah. I'm excited. I just try to find things that the kids, are going to love that the Friday night crowd is going to love because that's where we perform the most. I mean, we do do contests, but um, Friday nights is where, you know, our community is going to see our, our show. And so I want them to feel great about it and get a good reaction from the crowd and that feeling they get, because we do have good attendance at football games um, and the, you know, home crowd loves the shows we do. And so, and they understand the shows we do. Um, there's no, I don't know super theatrical thing, you know, but we're just having a good time playing good music and um, doing well at contests with that. I, I think last year I was able, I was really proud uh, of the show we had because we were able to do well at contests and still do well at Friday nights. And it was a good blend of things, you know? So I think the, the shows really help for sure. Cause they were like, Oh, that piece. I love that song. You know, we did a Taylor Swift song last year. So everybody was like, Taylor Swift, I got to do the show, you know? Um, and so that was a big help. Um, and then, you know, when we're in rehearsal, I try really hard to keep what I call hype up, you know, so we'll run a set and then I'm like, run it back. And when they run it back, the kids get like really crazy running back and screaming and yelling and, you know, cause it's hard, you know, March band's hard. We all know that. Um, and so we got to find a way to make it fun throughout the rehearsal. Um, and so we do that. And then, uh, and our pet, I don't know, the kids in my school love pet band. They are so crazy. They're high energy. We stand up the whole basketball game. Um, although I'm sure they would love to sit down sometime. I'm like, we're a pet band. That's why we're here. Let's go. But I'm like jumping up and down with them. And, you know, I'm doing the things. If I'm going to ask them to do something, I'm going to do, I should be able to do it. Right. Um, and so I do all that stuff with them. Um, but I think, you know, I think it starts, I think you're, guests before Scott Lang talked about like it starts with who's on the podium and I really feel really strongly about that so um right before I went to Montgomery Central I read a book uh called Good to Great uh mm -hmm. it's by Jim Collins there's also the other book he wrote Built to Last but he talks about being a level five leader you know in that uh book and he says you know that those people who are level five leaders um have the resolve to do whatever is needed they're fantastically driven. Um, they really care about what they do and they have great passion. Um, and they describe their job as a love affair. So, you know, it's like, are you in love with your job? Like I get to go to school every day and teach music to kids. Like what better job is that? You know? And, and so I think as we get older, you know, um, it's harder to keep that perspective maybe, um, but I try when I'm in the band room, yeah, there's stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Maybe you have a parent issue or maybe admins driving you crazy with another task or whatever. But, um, you know, when you walk in the band room and you get on the podium, like 
like that's the time to leave it off the field, which is also something I talked about my kids, you know, we, I teach high school, there's drama, they have drama, you know, from lunch or whatever it was, boyfriend, girlfriend, trouble. I might like, leave it off, you know, off the field or off the, in the band room. Cause this is the moment where we get to, to touch into some emotional things and just have a great time while we do it. Do you do that? Cause you, you mentioned that the level five, and it took me a second mm -hmm. to realize just yeah. now, do you, does that something concrete you do with the kids to become a level five leader? Do they know the steps to take takes to get there? Um, um, no, I talk with them more about just leading by example, you know, like if, if you shouldn't be like, you know, talking over her, like we're not going to do it. So my seniors know that and they'll like in a heart, they'll tell the freshmen like that's can't control themselves. Like, Hey, what are you doing? You know? Um, and at the same time, I don't, I'm not so strict that I, you know, there are moments in rehearsals where we talk and have, you know, breaks, mental breaks and things like that and tell jokes and, or tell a story or, you know, and I try to show them that I'm a human as well. Like last week I went to change my oil and it was the first time I think I've ever done that. Cause usually my husband does it for me. <laughs> so it was an interesting experience. And I was like, couldn't, understand English in that moment. So I was telling them that, you know, I just try to make them see that I'm not perfect, you know, um, and then I am a human and we have emotions too. And last year, uh, two years ago, I lost my brother-in-law and we just happened to be doing Randall Standridge's um, un Unbroken. Um, is that Unbroken? <laughs> I'm lacking in title right now, but I, you know, we played that piece and we just talked about you know, that even though things are bad in your life, it's not the end of the, the, the cycle and things will get better. And so I don't know, I just try to, I try to lead by example and I teach my kids to do that. Um, and it works for me. So, well, we have a it's good time. obvious because your energy is fantastic. I'm sure your kids absolutely adore you and I'm sure it's very, very, very reciprocal, but, um, you teach in Tennessee, um, you mm -hmm. know, how often does it rain during marching season? How, <laughs> you know, cause a lot of us, yeah. you know, like just for those of us who had, you know, I call it snow apocalypse 2024. Mm -hmm. We all, so it seems like mm -hmm. half the country had it. You know, many of us lost, you lost a week of instruction differently than mm -hmm. I lost a week of instruction. Yeah. So how is, how is, uh, how is your seasons going with the rain? Does it affect too yeah. much? Or how do you make, you know, how do you it make just it? just depends. I mean, anybody will tell you if you visit Tennessee, if you don't like the weather, wait 15 minutes because it's going to change. And I think that's very true. Um, it just depends. You know, this season wasn't very rainy. So we had a great, great season. We're outside a lot, but the previous season was very rainy. Um, and here it's like when it rains, it's like soaking rains, you know? So like the field is like, you cannot get on the field at all. So then you have to like plan B, where are we going to go? And then uh, space is a minimum in my school. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it can be difficult, but you just try to figure it out and make the most of it. Um, it gets really humid and hot. Like we had heat index issues this, this summer, like, you know, the county says we can't go out if it's above 104. Um, so it gets humid really fast after it rains for 10 minutes and then it's really humid, you know. Um, so we have to make sure we're taking care of our kids in that respect. And then like right before December, the winter break, we unfortunately had tornadoes that wrecked the part of the town and some schools over there. So we were out a whole week then. And then we just had the snow apocalypse. So um, we were out for a week for that. So um, you know, it can affect and we're getting ready and gearing up for CPA and we're doing a music affiliate music for all at, at Belmont university, which I'm really excited about. And, um, so, you know, you just readjust your plans and try not to let it affect you on the podium and, um, try to insist on the kids that it's even more important <laughs> that you're practicing and doing those well, that, things that you got to do. Well, that led me to, to what I wanted to talk to from you next. Cause I, I, like I said, mm -hmm. you have so many things that I'm like interested in learning more from you about, yeah. but you know, if, if not, Every well, first off, you teach at a smaller school. Our schools are extremely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're five kids different in our school sizes. Yeah. So do you have do you have a lot of kids that are in a sports and you know how do you handle? Oh yeah. Them? Because those of us at smaller schools, and I think those of you at really small mm -hmm. schools, it's pretty much the but the smaller the school, the more your school is the sports, the band, the choir, everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. we're at that point about a thousand kids. How many kids do you share between sports, and how much does that affect you? Um, I, I share a lot of kids with JROTC. We have a fantastic JROTC program. They're nationally recognized um, in the contest they go to. Um, so a lot of kids do that. Um, I would say, I was trying to think in my head how many, 
just trying to count. Um, my concert band's around 60, 50, 60, somewhere in there. So I think probably 10 or so or at RTC. Um, <clears throat> you know, you just share them. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. it's, you want to keep them, of course. You want them to be in band the whole time. But also, I want my kids to feel like they can be well-rounded and, and, and have a little bit of everything they want, you know. Oh, um, I have kids that do wrestling. Yeah. I'm sneaking this question in, which is if your kids okay. miss a rehearsal, and I know every of us have mm -hmm, a kid that mm -hmm, misses a rehearsal, mm -hmm. what, yeah. what are the things that you do for kids if they miss a rehearsal? Yeah. Like, how, how do they make it up, or what, what do they do? Yeah, yeah, I have them make a – they have to play for me. Because if I, I need to know like individually where everybody's at, right? So we, I mean, we, yes, we have playing tests and in class and yes, we do them in class because I want them to play, you know, in front of people. Cause that's what we do. We perform for people. Right. But if they miss a rehearsal, then I usually just uh, throw a playing assessment in Google classroom um, where they can play whatever chunk we worked on in class or in rehearsal that day. Um, so I can not to grade it, not to give them like, Oh, a, 97 or 85 but just to give them feedback you know i just type comments in the google thing and um i say this is great but you know hey this articulation was not exact so just watch that you know because i want to know that they are progressing and parents are aware that they have to do that which i talk about in our meeting at the beginning of the year um I'm getting ready to do tomorrow night is my eighth grade parent meeting actually. Um, so we'll talk about that. So they, you know, I don't get much parent pushback on it because they're aware of the expectations ahead of time. Um, so they just have to play for me. Um, and it's, you know, usually a big chunk of it, you know, big chunk of the piece that we're doing. So I can just see. What are some of the playing assessments that you do? Cause I think you told me that mm -hmm. you did playoff assessments in class and you took yeah. up how long in the class period yeah. did you say? It doesn't take long. I try to make them short, you know, just enough that I can hear. So like this past week, we were working on concert G flat because the March we're playing the trio is in G flat. So I'm working that scale. So they, the tomorrow's a playing test in class. So they'll do the scale in arpeggio uh, and then scale in thirds. And so I just, you know, my classes, I don't have a terribly big band program yet. I hope to in the future as as we continue our, our, our culture building, but um, you know, it doesn't take very long for a kid to play. I mean, that takes like 30 seconds for them to play that. And so I just have a rubric and I circle the things and I move on circle, move on. And then we do, you know, we do our warm up first, everybody's playing. Um, and then I give them a couple minutes to run through it one last time. And then we each take turns and then I grade them later. I, I mean, I circle on the rubric what I feel like they need to be, but then later I grade them and put them in the grade book. Um, and then we move on with class and we still get to rehearsal time. And then for what type, what's your typical, mm -hmm. say, you know, 80% of your rehearsals, what's a typical rehearsal look like? Mm -hmm. How long are your rehearsals? Yeah. What's the standard yeah. setup for your band? Yeah, yeah, I have band every day for 45 minutes. Um, so the kids are trained to come in and get their instrument out and get going. So they do that pretty fast. Um, I always do announcements because we have a lot of things that I want to make sure I, they can't tell me I didn't tell them, you know. <laughs> um, so we go through that and then um, we have some clear targets in Montgomery County. That's a big thing is um, for admin side. They like to see you talk about clear targets and that you go back to them. And so we just have some clear targets that we go over and then um, what's which are basically the goal for the day. Um, and then we warm up, uh, we tune every day. We have a tuning segment that we do. We play corral, um, do the scale. Usually I warm up with scales and use the scales to teach any rhythms or articulations that I think we might struggle with that day in class. And then we play the corral and then we tune and then we hop in into the music. Um, and then, you know, I, I have a, a master plan that the kids don't know about, but I'm like today's day has to be this, you know, measures what 106 to whatever it is and we break it down and I really break it down because um, I think I've come to a point in my teaching career especially after COVID that I, you know I, I as much as we want kids to go home and practice I'm not sure that they will do that always like you want them to um, and so I just help them with that process so we break it down every section every part of the section we're doing and then we put it back together and then we run a bigger trunk so it's really macro micro macro um within a single lesson um and then we cl close up with the clear target and did you meet those goals and and then we're out so that's five days a week and we do not meet all together so i have brass class two woodwind classes um and then i have uh, color guard and percussion class 
Um, and then I get two plannings, which is based on my relationship with my admin, which we can talk about in a little bit. But um, I have a great schedule. I teach dual enrollment music appreciation with some juniors and seniors. Um, and they hired somebody else uh, last year. So I now have an in-house assistant. Um, and during the day, he teaches um, guitar, general music, student fan fantastic job with that um, and after school he comes and helps me so because we don't meet um, all, all together during the day th we meet after school um, to put it all together Tuesday Thursdays from 2 30 to 4 30 um, and I really like that setup because it's like we have sectional time you know during the day and then we put everything together and whose parts the more important who's not as important here hey there's a dynamic change there you know the <laughs> things around the notes um, so it's a good setup for us and you said your your school is six through twelve for the for the high school. It is not. It is nine through twelve. But nice. I because I'm able to go over to the middle school every day, I can talk with the middle school director and the kids over there. I've built relationships with the eighth grade. I get to go to eighth grade band, um, oh. and so I just talk with everybody about having the six through twelve mentality and gotcha. trying to impart that on the middle school director because um, we want to keep the kids. We want to start a lot of kids and then we want to keep them. So if you start with this mentality of, oh, my kid's going to do this through senior year, like, and here's what it can get you. It can get you scholarships and you don't have to be a music major and, you know, that kind of stuff. It, it, it the, the parents get on board really fast. Um, so I just talk about us being a big band, six through 12. Gotcha. So what's your uh, relationship number between being a teacher and an entertainer? What's the, you know, and uh, like yeah, it's an e equal mix, I think. I mean, if kids bored in rehearsal and they're bored every day and they're having a good time, like I, they're not going to stick the, around. Right. And so how, you know, how often do you get, you know, you get to visit the younger kids. Do you find yourself mm -hmm. more entertainer, more teacher, you know? And, you know yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, yeah. I want to be as bubbly as possible, especially middle school kids. I mean, I've taught middle school and like, you know, seventh graders don't have very much of an attention span. You know, sixth graders just want to please you. Seventh graders, <laughs> like, whatever. Eighth graders, of course, this time of year, eighth grade's hard because they they made their trek up to the high school to find out what high school offers, and they're starting to register for classes, so they, like, they're kind of done, you know? It's like seniors right before graduation. They have eighth grade one, itis. <laughs> is it one school that feeds into you, or is it a bunch mm -hmm. of schools that this feed one, into you? This one. We have, like, I think two elementaries that feed into the middle and then the middle school into us. Um, oh, great. So it's just the one. And I'm lucky it's on the same like parking lot. I just walk. It's like a two minute walk from the high school over. Um, so I just walk over and and go help the middle school guys, whatever he needs. Sometimes I pull kids for honor band auditions and sometimes I run class and sometimes I just walk around and help, you know. And speaking of that culture of honor band, mm -hmm. um, I know for a lot of us, it depends on where you're at, your resources. I know like, you know, the school I teach at now, it's a definitely different than what I used mm -hmm. to teach in the big city. You know, when I taught, you know, for those of you who don't know, yeah. I actually taught in Nashville for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's why you know where the rain is before that I, mm -hmm. I lived in Arizona. And so I was always in the big city for a long time, but I'm, I'm still outside of Portland right now, but it is this mm -hmm. next statement is definitely true. The private teaching thing in my area is kind of based on two things. Mm -hmm. It's kind of far. I'm separated by mm -hmm. a state, by a, by a you know, Lewis and Clark, as I call it. Um, but you know, my kids don't have necessarily the greatest access to private mm -hmm. lessons, you know, yeah. and, and then it comes down to affordability. You know, the, you know, we talk about, you know, the, the economy, the last few years, you know, we always forget the, the private lessons is an economy too. And that lessons mm -hmm. that used to be 20, $25 or that person is now, Hey, yeah. I'll, just charge you, I'll just charge you 50 bucks and you're going, yeah, oh, they, don't, they don't have this. So. What right. are some of the things that you've come yeah. to do to overcome the private lesson thing? Do kids yeah. take private lessons? You know, where are you at with the private lessons? Yeah, I do have some kids that take private lessons. Um, I mean, I talk about it in that parent meeting. Like, this is the best way to get your kid to exponentially jump on their instrument and quality and to be able to make the honor bands. You know, our Middle Tennessee honor band is pretty stiff competition. So, um, you know, we talk about that, but I teach in this rural part of Montgomery County and it's not always feasible for them to, to do that, you know, economically. Um, so how I combat it is one, I have after school days where I just stay and do what I call, I guess you could call them doctor's visits. So if we're doing auditions, you know, I spend 10 minutes with this kid and 10 minutes with that kid. And I do that every week leading up to our 
um, auditions. Um, I have student teachers. So sometimes, you know, I, I typically have student teachers. So I make them stay and we conquer and divide, you know. Um, and then I'm very fortunate with my um, home um, college of Austin P being, um, they're not that far from us. It's about, I don't know, maybe 10 minute drive, 15 minute drive. Um, and they have some awesome professors, Dr. Spencer Pruitt um, at, at Austin P is a clarinet professor. He's like one of the best teachers I know, like he has so many tips and tricks and stuff. And so, um, and Dr. Lisa Wolnick, the flute professor, they're all willing, Dr. Rob Waugh, the trumpet professor, I have good relationships with them. And so they're willing to come out and they do master classes um, at least once a semester for me. Um, and so, you know, they get this, the kids have access to these amazing teachers um, and, you know, it's free for them. And we all benefit from it, you know. We also have the military bands uh, here. We have Fort Campbell, you know, so sometimes I can reach out to them and they'll come out. I know um, I taught at another high school in town and they would come out and do sectional time with the kids and sit in rehearsal. And um, so there's also that aspect that I can uh, dip into if I need to. Well, hopefully for that honor band, those etudes, those kids are playing aren't too hard. So let's move mm -hmm. on to the next yeah. question. We yeah. actually have one from our studio audience. Uh -oh. um, so, awesome. having, so having a new band around, this comes from Alexis Graham, having a new band of my own, I'm curious on how you manage and foster meaningful connection as students struggling musically, et cetera, et cetera. Have you ever had yeah. specific students that stuck with you? Yeah, I mean... I think I was keeping the back of my mind. Joel Denton has that saying. He, I love Joel Denton. He's an amazing man. Joel's um, amazing. He's awesome. Awesome. You know, they don't care how much, you know, until they know how much you care. Right. Um, so Wait, if I have, can we, can we write that down to the people in the background? Cause yeah. that is a, that is a quote to yeah. keep. That is a Joel quote. I love, I love, you know, at least that's who I've heard it from. I'm sure he might attribute his own statements to other people, but I, you know, he has that um, statement and it just really rang true with me when I first heard him say it. Um, so, you know, I get to know my kids on a personal level. Um, like I know that one kid loves anime and I know that one kid loves Taylor Swift and I know one kid's a stranger things addict has an addiction to that. You know, it's just, you know, you get to know them and so that you can make like when you do have to push them musically, like, they know it's not personal that you're coming from a place of love, you know? Um, yeah, I, you know, I will say that, and this is my quote to go with mm -hmm. that quote and what mm -hmm. you just said, but people remember you for how they make you feel, how you make them yeah. feel. Yeah. And so for that question of how do you keep them, connect to them and they'll stick with you mm -hmm. forever. They and, I, will. and you also, and you also said, I've had kids that were in band. I said, not everybody's in band to be technical. And I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think I ever will believe that everyone has to play if a kid, mm -hmm. you know, struggles to play all, all their scales yeah. or all the music, yeah. there's still a place in band for you. We just got to find yeah. it different. And we know a that different place. Yeah. Well, some kids don't do it out of purpose. Like there are some kids that, you know, I, you, you, we all have that kid that struggles with rhythm. We have a kid that struggles mm -hmm. with yeah. and hearing. Um, but I, 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 you know, my recommendation, at least from, from what I read is that relationships are everything. And then whatever they're everything. Really, and the like, longer I teach, the more I, wish I knew that when I was a younger teacher. Right. Um, and I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to giggle. I'm going to giggle on the next question because I think we talked okay. about this yesterday. Okay. And so, you know, I think, you know, my answer to this, but okay. how do you pick music as well? Yeah. Um, how, what you pick matters <laughs> just like relationships matter. You've got to well, know your kids and their level, you know, you've got to reach I out will. to people that know your group and can give you suggestions because they've heard your group and they know what your group can do, you know, Music is important. It's like your wedding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So pick, pick something old, something new. Something new. Something and, and borrowed. It's a borrowed, but it's not borrowed. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I wrote a, my And my a march. Thesis. <laughs> yeah, always a march. My thesis, uh, my thesis was on the student teaching experience. Yeah, and I always give the same advice: year one, teach. Mm -hmm. What else? Nothing. Teach. Year two, teach. Nothing else. Teach. Year mm -hmm. three, teach. Then you can start asking me questions. But if you ask me a question, I'm going to say, "Are you teaching?" Um, but you know, when mm -hmm. I say something borrowed, I don't think I programmed for the first five years of my career because I didn't trust myself, and I still yeah. don't. I still, everyone who knows me knows I'm going to say, "Hey, what do you play? What do you got? Yeah, what works?" Yeah. You know. 
and you know, finding those people. And I'll tell Alexis mm -hmm. this: there's, I bet you, Vanessa is more than glad to answer that question based upon mm -hmm. experience. I am more. I love literature to death, but it's again, we yeah. you can't program for my band until you know my band. I can't program for you. So yeah, you got to know I your weaknesses do. and strengths and. Yep. My answer to how do you pick music as well is for me personally, and this is not everyone, but for me personally is I, I don't necessarily pick the music. I, I, mm -hmm. I network the music until I feel like I'm going to go. Yeah. Yeah. With, with yeah. Help, help. Yeah. We have a suggested list, you know, especially for CPA. So I usually sit with that list and go alphabetically down the grade. I think we're going to be, and I find, um, I have to find a score. If it doesn't have a score that I can look at, then I don't tend to pick it. Um, so when I'm yep. on JW Pepper or whatever music site, I'm just, you know, if it has a score I can look at, because I need to see like, what is this range of the clarinet? What is the range of the trumpet? Um, you know, and so I just alphabetically, I go down, I spend a lot of time, especially in prepping for CPA. Um, and then I go to my secondaries, which are my people that I trust, you know, um, that have heard my group, worked with my group. Um, and I say, I think about doing these four pieces and then they help me trim it down, you know, and then I, I go from there. Um, and then, you know, I try to, well, I try to pick some diversity and composers. I haven't always been good about that, but the past couple of years I've, I've made a conscious, more conscious effort of doing mm -hmm. that. And then I try to have something that I know the kids are going to be really excited about because when you have to feed them like a, what we would call a major work. Um, it's not always, they're not always the most exciting pieces, you know, but there's something I feel strongly <laughs> that they need to learn, but you got to like give them a dessert here and there, you know, something that they're going to get really excited about to play and um, we'll keep them, keep them going. You know, when I first got to Montgomery central, we couldn't even sight read a site, a, a grade two piece, like effectively, you know, so we started in grade two. So I had to know, you know, what pieces for a high school band in grade two are going to be great pieces, you know, and there's a lot of really great pieces out there. And I'm also a big, um, I guess I'm really big on, you don't have to do the most, you don't have to do a grade six to get a musically rewarding mm -hmm. experience. You know, I actually prefer to do a little bit easier and be able to get all the things around the notes and to dig into the meaning of it and to make that emotional connection with my students and myself to the piece um you know that's how i kind of look at my pieces as i'm picking them and for um, me i always i always yeah. say this program for the band you have not the one yeah. you want that's and right teach you know, I, you know, mm -hmm. I always have kind of the, the first concert of the year is mm -hmm. kind of a little bit of a test yeah. to see if I think I know where my band is at. Yeah. Sometimes I miss the mark, but by that second concert, mm -hmm. you know where yeah. the, the mark is. Um, yeah. But like I said, I, you know, Alexis, my whole thing is seek out answers from everyone and validate it for yourself. Get help. Yep. And because, you know, if yeah. it doesn't ring true to your heart, then it doesn't necessarily ring true. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right, Vanessa Cobb. It looks like we're running out of time. I can't um, believe we're so already out of time. I, I told you we yeah. would go fast, did I not? Yeah, it, it went fast. How, how about a final question for me? Yeah, one my thing. final one thing. Okay. Um, I guess, what is your band? I know, because you talk about your process that you use all the time. So what mm -hmm. what does a typical band class look like for you? My band class is super, the, I am super regimented. So it's like, I um, mean, I have a 50 minute mm -hmm. period on four yeah. of the days of the week or 55. I don't mm -hmm. know. I lost track of time. I don't even look at that. Um, yeah. My warm ups last a good 15, 20 minutes, but I have a process. Mm -hmm. uh, you say this. My belief is if my kids can play all 12 scales at every grade level, that then they can sight read. And after they can sight read, mm -hmm. then we can sight read. Um, but so that first 20 minutes is scales, thirds, arpeggios, Clark studies, corrals. Um, all of those things um, always. Mm -hmm. And I have a process and I'm going to leave it because my guest next week actually did a presentation on my, my warm up process. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it was something that I, I used to run a district and we just kind of accepted it from there. So then mm -hmm. the rest is rehearsal. My micro macro, my macro, I'm sorry, my macro micro macro, my recipe is Friday is always macro day. And then whatever mm -hmm. time is left after micro macro day, we do for micro, but we always have a, um, like mm -hmm. for example, this last Friday, um, we ran, we listened to each piece of uh, a recording and they weren't allowed to play finger long, make check marks. And then we played through it and oh my gosh, like the differences. And then mm -hmm. don't be proud. We ended with the March. Um, um, and so, because uh, for those of yeah. you like the correct, the trio turned into a corral is the best teaching tool yeah. in my opinion. So that's my, that's my right. answer is it's 20, yeah. 20 minutes of, 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 mm -hmm. of, of 
of technique and musicianship mm -hmm. and then 30 minutes of music. And it's mostly macro for the first two weeks. It's mostly micro for the next whatever. And then it's mostly macro, but really Friday is macro. Mm -hmm. All right, Vanessa. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for coming. And to my audience, yeah. uh, her email is up there. Um, I'm sure you can get a hold of Vanessa. Send her, a, mm -hmm. send her something. All of my former guests would love to hear from you. Yeah, um, for sure. If we're all band nerds, we like talking shop and mm -hmm. man, it's just so fun. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll just say one last thing. One last thing is if you don't have, if you don't know your admin and guidance and bookkeepers and front office ladies on a, like a personal level, you need to work on that because it will help you get the things you want. I don't have the teaching schedule I have without that relationships and like knowing something about them outside the building, right? Um, if you don't know them outside the building and know what their interests and likes and what they are as a human being, like, man, that goes such a long way to get things that you need for your program. No joke. Mine like a breakfast burrito with every meat and guacamole. That's right. And I do it. Yes. Like the bookkeeper likes sweet tea. We, you know, it's like, we, we celebrate yeah. what they are. And then thank you, Vanessa. Right. You've been amazing. Yep. Thanks so much for being a part. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of show number three in our first live one, which again, feels still looks like the recorded one. It's very lonely in this room. I want to just throw that out there, but let's talk about uh, next week and what's about to come up. So um, first off, I want you to think about the things, uh, pop comments. If you're in the YouTube, even if it's later, even if you're watching this a year down the road or, you know, things that have happened, maybe a connection or just tell us your story, um, help us build this content. Um, so let's talk about the next segment. The next segment is uh, somebody I'm very interested for you to meet. So this person teaches at, um, a, they teach at a K-8 that's not really a K-8. It's really a K-6 and a middle school. It's also the gifted academy. So the gentleman teaches at a K-5 that, or K-6 that feeds himself, but he also is fed by other schools. And at the same time, he has a magnet program that lives on top. And so not only does he feed one high school, he feeds an entire district. So you're, it's a very special and unique program. And this gentleman, his name is Ryan Rocky. He teaches in Glendale, Arizona. He is, his the culture of his cl classroom is amazing. Um, we have been talking and he sends videos all the time. And I think it's someone you're going to be excited to meet. Um, so come back next week on Sunday. It's the 25th, uh, 4 p.m., sorry, 7 p.m., Eastern time, 4 p.m. Central. All these time zones kill me. Um, and just remember, you can watch this live on YouTube. You can watch it recorded on YouTube. You can download it on Apple Podcast. You can stream it on Spotify. Um, we started a Facebook page. Um, go ahead and look that out. And Instagram is coming this week, and I've got that going. So I hope to find my way to get to you. All right, culture before content people. I hope to see you next week. Uh, I'd love to hear from you as well. And have a great week and see you next Sunday.